Well, the message, it remains unchanged. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz today delivered an unequivocal message of support for Ukraine, also saying that Western allies will stop short of any direct involvement in this war. Speaking after talks with other leaders, Schultz today sharply criticized Russia's latest offensive in eastern Ukraine, and he blamed Russian President Vladimir Putin for war crimes against civilians. Our principles are clear. Everyone agrees on them. Ukraine continues to have our full solidarity and support. At the same time, as heads of state and government, it's our duty to prevent the war from spreading to other countries. Therefore, NATO does not want to and cannot intervene directly in the war. And that's how it will remain. Everyone agrees on that. Our policy is guided by these principles. Maximum support for Ukraine, but no NATO involvement in the war. All right, let's bring in our correspondent, Simon Young. Good to see you, Simon. So the German chancellor today saying we're delivering a message uh, basically that Nothing's changed, right? Well, it, it can look like that, uh, Brent. Uh, he talks about uh, solidarity with Ukraine uh, and uh, support and unity among the allies uh, in NATO and uh, the G7. Um, and uh, at the same time, Germany certainly faces pressure from uh, from uh, the government in Kiev, uh, but also from Washington and other partners to uh, do more. Um, when it comes to weapons, uh, what uh, Olaf Scholz has been saying is that there's no point in delivering uh, weapons that uh, um, Ukraine can't use immediately. So uh, the emphasis is on uh, is on other kinds of support. Ger Germany, he says, has delivered as much as it can in the way of weapons from its own stocks. But he's only really been talking about um, you know, anti-tank weapons, so-called light weapons, also some ammunition. He says that kind of support will continue, uh, but he's not, it seems, talking about uh, providing uh, heavy weapons directly, the kind of thing that Ukraine says it needs in order to defend its territory. Uh, instead, Olaf Scholz says, well, Germany will help to finance, it'll help to do the logistics, it'll presumably provide the export licenses and so on. Mm -hmm. But in terms of actually sending the tanks and the helicopters, that's not going to happen. And, and Simon, there appears to be uh, a lack of clarity in knowing um, exactly to what extent Germany is willing to help Ukraine in terms of, of weapons. Why is there a lack of clarity on that? I think there's been some uh, difficulty uh, in the messaging, uh, you know, that uh, the Schultz government has uh, used a number of different arguments. As I was saying, they've, they've emphasised this point uh, that, uh, you know, there's no point in equipping the Ukrainians with uh, things that they can't mm -hmm. immediately use. That won't help them in the fight. So uh, they've talked about uh, supporting other uh, countries, Eastern European countries, who still have stocks of Soviet-era equipment, for instance, which can be, uh, you know, more or less uh, deployed in Ukraine without further training efforts. Uh, I mean, that is an argument for sure. But on the other side, countries like the US and some other NATO countries are sending heavy uh, materiel. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they're clear, they see, there seems to be a difference of opinion uh, within the NATO uh, partners. Our Simon Young with the latest tonight here in Berlin. Simon, as always, thank you. Well, Russia's foreign minister has today confirmed that a new stage in what the Kremlin calls a special military operation has begun. Sergei Lavrov says that Moscow's overall objectives have not changed. Take a listen. Operation in the east of Ukraine uh, is uh, uh, aimed, as was announced from the very beginning, to fully liberate the Donetsk and Lugansk republics. And this operation uh, will, will continue. It is beginning, uh, I mean, another stage of this operation is beginning. Uh, and I'm sure this will be uh, a very important moment of this entire special operation. Right, and for more now, I'm joined by Samuel Romani. He teaches politics and international relations at Oxford University. He's also the author of the forthcoming book, Putin's War on Ukraine. It's good to have you on the program um, tonight. What do you make of what we just heard from Sergei Lavrov there? Um, basically saying this goal of taking control of Donbass remains and nothing has changed. What, how do you read that? 
Well, I think that obviously the war was justified at the start as a mission to protect uh, the people of Donbass, the ethnic Russians who were living there, from what Vladimir Putin called an alleged genocide from the Ukrainians. And that's why the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics were recognized right before the war, and they were the two republics that invited Russia into this, first in a peacekeeping capacity and then in an official uh, military capacity. So uh, Russia's keeping its rhetoric uh, consistent, but I think it's got much bigger goals, probably still a regime change in Kiev, even if uh, Lavrov denies that. And if Russia were to be able to capture the east, the Donbass, would they be able to hold on to it long term? Well, I think that some areas they have a good chance of holding on to. For example, they're already starting their offensive in areas like uh, Rubizhny and Papazna, which are vital for the uh, consolidation of the Luhansk Oblast into uh, Russia's uh, orbit. So uh, once that's uh, settled, as well as Donetsk, they'll probably seek to bring Donetsk and Luhansk formally annexed into Russia, much like Crimea. The rest of the uh, regions, maybe aside from Kurzon, which they captured uh, with little resistance early on, there'll probably be a lot of insurgencies and a lot more problems. So if they were to capture Kharkiv and Odessa, they'll have a lot harder time keeping that than they would keeping territory in Donetsk and Luhansk, simply because the pro-separatist militias there are strong forces that can police and create a near totalitarian environment for the Russians. And what does that mean then for the capital, Kyiv? I mean, can people in Kyiv, can they sleep with relative security that there will not be a new Russian offensive or a new threat of a... Russian invasion there? Well, I think that no part of Ukraine can really sleep easily right now. That's why it was pretty telling when the Ukrainian government released an air raid alert over the entire country, except for Kurzon and Crimea. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw unpredictable Russian strikes in Lviv yesterday, and the capital is still a target, according to the Russian Defense Ministry. They say that they're targeting uh, decision-making centers. Um, of course, when they say they're targeting government centers or military infrastructure, they end up targeting civilians as well because their bombing is so indiscriminate. So the people of Kiev should remain on alert and they should remain cautious and vigilant of the fact that if Russia is allowed to succeed in Donbass, they will make another charge towards the capital. And there's so many people around Putin in the Duma and his advisory circle who are cheering that on. And what about the weapon known as economic sanctions that the West has slapped on Russia? Those don't take effect overnight, but we heard today from the head of the Russian Central Bank that the entire economy is now beginning to feel the bite of those sanctions. How important is that of a weapon in determining the outcome of this war? Well, economic sanctions are certainly going to bite, and the Russians are doing all they can to paper over the cracks. We've already seen the central bank cut interest rates after doubling them to 20 percent, then cutting them to 17 percent, and now probably cutting them down to maybe 15 percent on the 29th of April. We're seeing them increase uh, spending, increase pensions, to try to alleviate the short-term shocks. But uh, I don't think the sanctions are going to stop the war. The only way in which uh, sanctions could put uh, Russia's operations to a halt is if all European countries all of a sudden were to stop uh, buying Russian energy, which is extremely remote. It's got to be phased out. Or if some of the countries that are still trading with Russia, in particular China, were to make a drastic move away. And that doesn't seem to be happening. So I think the sanctions will erode the Russian economy in the long term, but they won't lead to a quick uh, ending of the war. Okay. Samuel, we appreciate your time and your insights tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much.